Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be the chairman of this great conference, the World Conference, attended by uh, more than a thousand people for presenting the latest trends in South Korea in plastic and reconstructed surgery. Now, why South Korea? Twelve years ago, my wife had a car accident resulting in a serious thoracic P9, P10 disc herniation requiring urgent surgery. I sent her MRIs to my friends in UCLA and Pittsburgh University in America, asking where should I send her, who's the best doctor? They all told me, go to South Korea, Wuridul Hospital in Seoul. So I went there and I was thoroughly impressed in that on the same day of her surgery, they had 53 spine surgeries scheduled. So I knew this is probably a place where they are good at it. But I was also impressed with their hospitality, with their friendship, to the culture of respect, and most importantly, the culture of discipline. Discipline is not a dirty word. Our children today need guidance and discipline and love. That keeps them away from bad company, drugs, and build self-esteem. The German culture shares the discipline, which made them the best economy in Europe, as opposed to other less disciplined cultures. Then, a few days ago, I asked my children, I want a new car. They know I don't like brands, I like value and quality and safety. So they all told me, buy a Genesis. I said, what is that? They said, that's the best car for your money. It's the safest car. It has self driving features, it stops by itself if you're distracted. Uh, the interior is like a Bentley or a Mercedes, leather interior, etc., etc. Uh, so I went to the showroom, I looked at the demo, and I was sorry, thoroughly impressed, and I ordered a car. The trouble is I have to wait until March 22 to get one. The regulators in this visionary country want the UAE to be carbon free in 2050. So they started five years ago looking for nuclear energy. After they did their homework, they teamed with the South Koreans because they have the safest and most value for their money in this industry. And we now have just started the factory on time and on budget in Abu Dhabi. Finally, I went at the last stem cell research, uh, sorry, stem cell conference, World conference, and attended. And I was most impressed by the research and presentation that were coming from South Korea. Now remember, stem cell is the future of medicine. It will have increasing applications in not only aesthetics, but in wound care and in nerve injuries, reconstruction, and we'll hear all of that from our speaker coming next. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next, or our first moderator, Professor Mario Cherubino. Professor Mario is a professor of the University of Serbia in plastic reconstructive and aesthetic surgery at the Department of Biotechnology and Science of Life. 
Since 2017, he has been director of the microsurgery and surgery of the Lymphatic, Lymphatics Research Center at the University of Houston. He focuses his activities on microsurgery, reconstructive and hand surgery, lower extremities, and this is a place where we have the largest plastic surgery department in Europe. He obtained plastic and reconstructive surgery, graduated in November 2010, and is moved to Multimedia Hospital, the largest hospital in Europe, uh, the hand surgery division in Milano, where he worked under the supervision of Professor Giorgio Fajardi. In 2012, he became a member of the Italian Hand Surgery Society Council. In 2014, he gained the fellow, fellow of the European Board of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery Society. He presented as an invited speaker at several international conferences. He published more than 50 papers in peer-reviewed journals. So, Dr. Mario. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm very excited to be part of this project and very happy to be here this morning. And uh, it, it, it's definitely uh, tremendous to be uh, part of this um, field and to be possible to share with people from South Korea and everybody in the world. So I would like to introduce the first speaker that will be Dr. Tai Suk that is an associate professor, as me, at the Department of Plastic Surgery at ESA Medical Center. He's having more than 20 years of experience in this field, and his surgery is focused on the hand and neck reconstruction, fetal trauma, facelift, so basically hand and neck. But obviously, he has done more than 50 publications about the cleft lip, and he's going to talk about uh, these topics. In particular, he's going to talk about curved line keloplasty in unilateral complete cleft lip patients. So please, Professor Suk, can you um, talk with us? <clears throat> and see the first presentation. Thank you for giving me opportunity to present. My name is Tezo Go. Associate Professor at Asam Medical Center, Department of Plastic Surgery. Hopefully, everybody is safe and getting well in this challenging time. Today, I will talk about curved line keloplasty, minimizing tissue sacrifice in unilateral complete cleft lip patient. I have nothing to disclose. In the anatomical subunit repair technique by Dr. Fisher, the lengths of both sides are numerically matched using a geometric method to achieve accurately symmetrical height of the normal and repair filtral column. Although the tissue diversity on the cleft side is considered, a straight line is consistently used in the design. And the sacrificed tissue on the cleft side is located outside the straight line. In this type of design, it may not be a problem if the cleft side tissue is fully sufficient. However, if a patient with a deficient lip soft tissue at cleft side undergoes such a type of surgery, the lack of tissue becomes more severe due to large truncation, resulting in a negative effect on lip growth after symmetry. In this study, we suggested three hypotheses. Number one, curved line matching of a filtral column. Number two, K point. Noodle point should be marked to match the vertical lip length. Number three, fail to sacrifice the lateral lip length for saving vertical lip height. This figure shows schematic illustration of the curved line keloplasty. O is point corresponding to point B on the cleft side marked on the OM upper border. K is point uh, corresponding to point A on the cleft side and upper border of the one millimeter triangle flap. Point K and point O form the imitated filtral on the cleft side. Length A can be the summation of rose thompson effect and length of the triangular flap added to length B. In this study, we attempted to make curved skin incision as much as possible on the cleft side 
along the original curvature of the cleft margin to minimize the amount of tissue sacrifice. Before implementing this method, the problem of quantitatively aligning the cleft side tissue to the filtral vertical length of the normal side should be solved. In Fisher's theory, this problem is solved by a geometrically linear line. In this study, we measure the length of the normal side using a flexible wire, mark the vertical length of the normal side on the wire, bend the wire according to the curve of the clap side, and drew an incision line. Just after finishing repair, you can see that well matched upper lip height, giving symmetrical lip. Using photograph and measurement program image J, we measured vertical and diagonal filtral height ratio between cleft and non-cleft side and horizontal lateral lip length ratio between curved and conventional straight line repair group. Vertical and diagonal height ratio measurement for filtral height and horizontal lip length ratio for sacrifice lateral lip catch-up. We attempted three-dimensional matching of the non cleft side filtrum using a flexible wire in this study group. Firstly, we measured the length from the nasal seal to the highest point on the cupid bow on the non cleft side and marked it on the wire. Considering the contour of the orbicular oris muscle, we marked the point O and matched it to the point B on the columella base. Thereafter, we marked the lowest point of wire as point K which was length B away from point O. After marking the older point, we inject the local anesthesia and incision along the design. Firstly, we elevate the air flap to reconstruct the nostril floor. In this procedure, we should be very careful not to injure um, main artery. After elevation of the mucosal air flap, we dissect the uh, tethered uh, muscle from the alveolar bone. The release should be uh, fully done because elevate the tethered ala base to the anterior direction. This procedure is very important to make a symmetrical nasal shape. After completion of air flap elevation, we match the elevated ala base to the normal side. And after that, we dissect uh, above the low lateral cartilage of the nose. After finishing air flap elevation, we elevate the M flap to match the air flap. And this flap is also used to, to reconstruct the uh, nostril floor. Primary septoplasty also done. The deviated nasal septum should be dissected from the ANS. After finishing 
L flap and M flap dissection. We reconstruct the uh, nostril flower with these two flap. And C flap is used to to correct the deviated nose base. And after that, we repair the mucosa of oral mucosa. And obicularis oris muscle repair was done from the upper margin. To prevent, to prevent the uh, nostril and vestibular web, we suture the endonasal tissue with the transfixation method. And after that, ala base cinching suture was done between medial crural foot plate and nasalis. Upper margin of obicular oris muscle should be sutured to the normal side. And after that, obicular oris muscle was sutured with bicular forgero. After finishing uh, muscle repair, dermal suture was done. And after that, uh, primary rhinoplasty uh, was done. Cleft palate was also accompanied about 50% in both groups, and pre alveolar molding was done about 80%. In vertical lip length analysis, curved repair group shows significant symmetrical filtral height in all follow-up time period during one year. In diagonal lip length analysis, both groups cut off non-cleft side height after one year. 
In horizontal lip length analysis, curved repair group shows sacrifice lateral lip length was restored only after three months. Uh, I will show the case number one. Three months boy with left side complete cleft lip was repaired using conventional method. This is warm side view. After six, six months view, warm side view after six months. After 14 months, warm side view after 14 months. Case number two, unilateral complete cleft lip with uh, conventional caloplasty. Three months girl with left side complete cleft lip was repaired using conventional method. Warm side view. 14 months after conventional caloplasty. Warm side view after 14 months. Uh, this is case number three, unilateral complete cleft lip with curved line caloplasty. Three months boy with left side complete cleft lip was repaired using curved line repair method. Warm side view. Six months after curved line caloplasty. Warm side view after six months. Case number four. Uh, unilateral complete cleft lip with a curved line caloplasty. Three months boy with left side complete cleft lip was repaired using curved line repair. Warm side view. Twelve months after curved line caloplasty. Warm side view after twelve months. Case number five. Unilateral complete cleft lip. Uh, in this case, Severely deficient lip tissue with curved line caloplasty. This girl has severely deficient tissue on her cleft side lip. We needed to trade off between vertical height and horizontal lip length. Immediate after operation, pulchral height was very short. But this video shows upper lip symmetry was restored after several months but we consider short lip correction when we do secondary deformity correction surgery. Dr. Future said that neural point should, be, uh, should not be compromised, but this study shows newly marked K point sacrifices uh, 1 to uh, 1.5 millimeter horizontal lip length, and it was cut off after five uh, follow-up months. To analyze the effectiveness of minimized tissue sacrifice, we need upper lip volume comparison. For further study, we are gathering three-dimensional data. In summary, this is the objective validation of anthropometric measurement by curved line caloplasty. Saving vertical height is not sacrificing the lateral lip length significantly. Another suggest on the anthropometric point Marking rather than rule point is needed. Thank you for attention. Be safe. That was a beautiful presentation, Dr. Taisu. Uh, Hi. It's amazing. Even the the child who was at the video where he, they are filming was well behaved. Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, our next uh, moderator. Uh, also, do, do we, have, we, have, uh, we have questions and answers. Yeah. I um, the, I read all the comments uh, for the participant and uh, they are very very excited about the amazing results. So really, Dr. Su Professor Suk, our Thank compliments for so the group. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you so uh, much. I haven't seen um, a real question about, and but I do have one because I would like to know. Uh, I I see that you start to do 
all the nasal management since the first surgery. Yeah. So you do yeah. first the second Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in, in your experience, even with this modified curved line, yeah. Do you need to do a secondary surgery of the nasal in, uh, after follow-up, or usually you deal everything on the first step, on the first surgery, even primary rhinoplasty? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in my uh, early period of my practice, I did not do primary rhinoplasty when I do primary cleft lip surgery, but I changed my practice okay. after that, but in, and now I usually do primary rhinoplasty with the limb incision, mm -hmm. with the low lateral cartilage suturing to the control lateral upper lateral cartilage. Yeah. But in such an uh, uh, such an effort, they are definitely some cases that need to be uh, to another secondary surgery, especially especially for the rhinoplasty because. Uh, congenital tissue deficiency is remnant uh, that we need to correct that uh, uh, that uh, mismatching between normal and cleft side. That usually the secondary cleft lip surgery and secondary uh, rhinoplasty usually done uh, about uh, six or seven years old. Yeah. Okay, six seven years. Yeah. Really. <clears throat> So thank you so much. It was very, uh, very good results, very exciting. And we learned yeah, something you. today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I give this speech again back to uh, Dr. Max, that is going to introduce the next moderator, I think. Do you want to take any questions from the... I check uh, now. And all of them are very astonished about, but there are not any questions. Well, it was okay. very clear on the site. Yeah. Um, the next uh, moderator is going to be Dr. Basil Hassoune. Uh, Dr. Basil is double board certified in ENT surgery, ear, nose, throat, and hence his interest in rhinoplasty, and, in face, and another board in facial plastic surgery. Um, Dr. Basil uh, has more than 10 years experience in ENT and facial plastic surgery. He completed his medical training at the University of McMaster, Canada, with multiple distinctions and awards. He completed his ENT surgery at the University of Manitoba, Manitoba in Canada. Dr. Basil subsequently trained with world-class leaders in facial plastic surgery in California, with Dr. Paul Nassif and with others. Following his training, he's been for the last six years building a practice in Toronto and in Dubai. So he's been visiting, uh, and uh, that's when we got to know each other. Dr. Basil has a special interest in rhino sinusitis and endoscopic nasal surgery, rhinoplasty, and the redo rhinoplasty operation. A lot of his ENT colleagues in Dubai refer their failed surgery to him because they, he keeps, uh, he doesn't badmouth them and he treats them very well and they return their patients back to them. So they really trust him. Dr. Basil attended many conferences and courses around the world in addition to organizing and presenting annual meetings on many topics such as otolaryngology, uh, head and neck surgery, facial plastic surgery, aesthetic and anti-aging medicine. He assisted in multiple academic scholarship, scholarly and medical researches, and has different publications related to radio frequency, laser resurfacing, nasal valve surgery, otolaryngology, and facial plastic surgery. Um, he, patients love him because he's very honest and he's very meticulous. He takes his time to perform surgery. Surgery takes minimum of two hours and sometimes up to four if they redo because he takes his time to make sure that his first surgery is going to be successful and he doesn't need to do another one. Okay, Dr. Basil, you take over. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. I'd like to applaud everybody for being here with us uh, on a Friday uh, to get the most up-to-date information on the field of uh, plastic surgery. And it is really a privilege to reach out to our Korean career uh, colleagues who have uh, really contributed greatly to the field of plastic surgery over the last 10 years, both clinically and in research. Please, uh, I would like now to welcome Dr. Heng Cheng uh, from Seoul National University Hospital. Uh, he has both MD and PhD degrees. He is the head and professor of the Department of Plastic Surgery. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Heng Cheng uh, has been long with the uh, Seoul uh, National University Hospital. He graduated from medical school there in 1989. Uh, and then he finished his extensive residency training in Japan in prestigious Seoul Medical School uh, in, the red, uh, in the field of plastic surgery. He also majored in neurological surgery at the uh, uh, Gushi Center, uh, as well as in general surgery in uh, Osaka National Hospital in Japan. Uh, he also had significant interest in research, particularly in the field of microsurgery, uh, uh, where he is a researcher at the uh, NYU uh, Research Center. He also finished fellowship in plastic surgery in uh, Yoren University Hospital, and he has several prestigious publications uh, in PubMed in the field of uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery. His clinical interests are in reconstruction of head and neck surgery after ablative uh, cancer resection, breast reconstruction, tummy tuck, extremity reconstruction and uh, perineal reconstruction. We also have uh, important interest in facial palsy, uh, facial nerve injuries and uh, lymphedema. Uh, I welcome Dr. Uh, Hang Cheng to his uh, uh, very interesting presentation uh, on facial nerve uh, uh, to get the most up-to-date uh, in treating facial nerve injuries and facial nerve palsy. Hello. I am Dr. Hak Chang from Department of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Seoul National University Hospital, Seoul, Korea. Today, I'm going to talk about up-to-date of facial nerve reconstruction. Facial palsy inflicts significant mobility and treatment aims to address functional, aesthetic, and psychological aspects. The facial nerve is responsible for providing the facial tone and movement necessary for ocular protection, nasal airflow, articulation of speech, and oral continence. Furthermore, psychosocial functioning of the individual is greatly influenced by the activity of the mimetic musculature. The causes of facial palsy are numerous and have been classified into congenital and acquired. The most common congenital facial nerve palsy is from birth injury and most patients recover within a month. Idiopathic isolated palsy of the mandibular division is a typical presentation, but the true instance is hard to define. Syndromic facial palsy is infrequent, but is most commonly part of hemifacial microsomia. Mabius syndrome is a rare congenital form of cranial nerve palsy. We should concern for neoplastic cause if unilateral facial weakness slowly increasing for more than three weeks or abrupt onset with no return of function in six months are observed. Most common cause is Bell's palsy. The instance is reported to be one in 5,000. Three quarters of the patient return to normal function, but a significant portion suffer sequelae such as weakness, hemifacial spasm, contracture, or synkinesis. Early treatment is centered on the use of corticosteroids and antiviral therapy to speed recovery and minimize residual deficit. The efficacy of acyclovir, however, has been deb debated and level one evidence shows no benefits over corticosteroid therapy alone. Three weeks period observation is acceptable before undergoing an extensive diagnostic workup. 
uh, multidisciplinary approach is key to achieving good outcomes for patient. A structured history and the clinical examination of the patient allows for accurate treatment planning. Once etiology is established, the next step is to ascertain the time elapsed since onset, as this will directly affect the surgical strategy employed. Clinical examination is performed from the brow down. The absence of ridges and the degree of the brow tosses are examined. The patient is asked to raise their eyebrows, close their eyes, and show their teeth. Bell's phenomenon is also documented. Nasal wave of collapse is examined using cuttle the test. The mouth is examined at rest with the amount of commissure droop and deviation of the filtrum to the contralateral side is measured. The excursion of the commissure is also quantified and degree of tooth show in shape of the smile are noted. Facial synkinesis is one of the most distressing consequences of long-standing facial paralysis. Synkinesis refers to the abnormal involuntary facial movements that are caused with the voluntary movement of different facial muscle group. The pathophysiologic basis of facial synkinesis is likely multifactorial, although the predominant mechanism appears to be aberrant regeneration of the facial nerve fibers to the facial muscle groups after facial nerve injury. Symptoms include abnormal muscle contractions of eye, mouth, middle face, and neck, tightness, rigidity, and hypolacrimation. Synkinesis can cause functional limitation with activities such as eating, drinking, smiling, and may even lead to social isolation. Synkinesis is diagnosed by history and physical examination. It typically does not require an imaging study to diagnose. Facial rehabilitation specialists guide patients through targeted exercises and design an individualized treatment regimen. Synkinesis does not respond to facial muscular retraining, may benefit from targeted injection of botulinum toxin to ease unwanted facial muscle spasm. The botox mechanism of action in the lacrimal gland is the presynaptic blockade of the acetylcholine release at cholinergic nerve endings, thereby reducing the stimulus on the gland activity. This mechanism is similar to that observed in the treatment of the hydrocysts of sweat gland and the sialuria of salivary gland. For some patients, the temporary relief provided by botulinum toxin can guide their surgeon towards surgical procedure for more long-standing benefits. Treatment plan is individualized and it is based on the pattern of the facial movements as well as the response to the botulinum toxin injections. The House Bregman grading scale, developed in 1983, is the most frequently used tool to assess degree of facial weakness. This scale has documented pitfalls, including that it does not fully represent facial function lacks sensitivity to subtle differences in severity of the weakness, and has documented high inter-observer variability. The Yanagihara facial nerve grading system was developed in Japan as a representative regional scale, which was standardized in Japan and in some other countries for grading facial function. The Yanagihara system measured 10 separate aspects of different facial functions. Each function is scored 0, complete per se, 2, partial per se, or 4, nearly normal, giving a maximum score of 40. The score provides information on the grade of facial nerve dysfunction. The SUNY Brew facial grading system is a comprehensive scale for the evaluation of the facial paralysis patients. It is relatively easy and quick. There is an evaluative difference between the weighted regional SUNY Brook and the gross house Bregman systems. However, these methods have limitation in the precise assessment because of subjectivity in diagnosis. Depending on the etiology, 
Imaging may be required to rule out malignant pathology or recurrence following tumor resection. Videography or a series of standardized photographs is taken for the medical record. Electrophysiological investigations are generally used to provide prognostic information in patients with partial or acute palsy, but these tests are of little value in patients with an established paralysis. Degeneration greater than 90% in electroneurography or a threshold difference greater than 3 mA in nerve excitability test is associated with poor prognosis. Side-to-side -side amplitude comparison and electromyography are the two most valuable electrophysiologic methods of asserting facial lobe function. In addition, the blink reflex is a polysynaptic reflex response of the orbicularis oculi muscle elicited by electrostimulation of the supraorbital nerve is mediated by the afferent trigeminal nerve, the brainstem, and the efferent facial nerve. The blink reflex test can be used to evaluate the function of the involved nerves. The persistence or early return of an absent R1 component of the blink reflex may quantitatively suggest a satisfactory function outcome in facial paralysis. There are several modalities for the treatment of the facial nerve palsy, such as acupuncture therapy, massage, and facial rehabilitation. Today, facial reanimation is the gold standard for the facial nerve palsy. The aim of facial palsy reconstruction is to treat functional issues, re-establish symmetry at rest, and restore dyna dynamic spontaneous movement. Numerous surgical options exist for the treatment of the facial paralysis. The key to successful outcomes is to establish the achievable treatment goals based on the patient's chief concerns in the decision-making process. Surgical plan is determined by the key factors, whether the injury is partial or complete, the presence of a proximal nerve stump, and the time elapsed since injury. First, ocular protection is the most important issue to be addressed in the treatment of the facial nerve palsy. The immediate concern is to preserve corneal in integrity by using lubrication and lid taping. Leg of thalamus is the most common symptom secondary to facial palsy. This is consequence of the loss of antagonistic muscles with a levator function for the upper eyelid. As a result, dryness, cornea keratitis, and continuous conjunctival irritation occur. The upper lid can be loaded with a gold weight. This provides good symptomatic relief from corneal exposure, but is associated with high extrusion rates after five years. Conca cartilage is a useful alternative to gold weight. Ectropion is secondary to loss of orbicular stone and compounded by ligamentous laxity in older individuals. For this, contal tensioning procedure such as cantopexy, cantoplasty, or fascial sling is required. In partial facial nerve palsy, the residual function in the nerve can be augmented by introducing an additional source of innervation in the form of cross-face nerve graft or nerve transfer. The end-to-side nerve coaptation is preferred to avoid reducing any residual function on that side. An alternative approach would be to minimize asymmetry by reducing function on the unaffected side by using botulinum toxin. Transection of facial nerve is suitable for direct nerve repair if detected early before retraction of the nerve ends has occurred. The use of nerve stimulator minimizes the chance of incorrectly matching the nerve ends. If there is tension on the direct optation, nerve grafting is mandatory, and tension has a negative impact on neural spirality. As a donor nerve, the sural nerve offers a two-team approach, has an excellent size match to the facial nerve, and has a minimal donor morbidity. 
if a proximal nervous stump is unavailable, then an alternative source of innovation needed to be considered. In complete injuries, a cross-face nerve graft or cranial nerve transfer will be required if there is no proximal nerve stump. Facial nerve stump anastomosis to hypoglossal, glossopharyngeal, accessory, or frenning nerves. Hypoglossal nerve transfer is the one of the most common procedures. This is best for immediate reconstruction of facial, proximal facial nerve during tumor extirpation. It provides excellent tone and normal appearance at rest. However, this may lead ipsilateral atrophy of the tongue musculature with effects on speech and swallowing. Babysitter procedure may be used as a temporizing measure to provide a faster re to preserve the musculature and possibly the denervated stump while the axons grow across the cross-face nerve graft. Recently, the use of motor nerve to the masseter has increasingly, increasingly pre performed. The benefit of using masseteric nerve include a single-stage procedure, preservation of the contralateral nerve, and a greater external load can be delivered to the muscle. A degree of cortical plasticity is thought to develop following a program of biofeedback exercises. In contrast, use of cross-face nerve graft does not require such cortical plasticity and may be more appropriate in some patient. From now on, I'll present the surgical options in case with absence of mimetic muscles after long-standing atrophy with no potential for useful function. Brow Pexy effectively treats impingement of, of superior visual field. Direct brow lift, balanced slice of skin excites just above the brow, is the most basic and effective form. In the region of mid face and mouth, steady and dynamic procedures are routinely used. Static procedures address the symmetry of the face at rest and are suitable for all the patients. Fascia lata and the palmaris longus tendon slings have been widely used to elevate the cheek, support the lower eyelid, create a nasolabial fold, and draw the nasal ala laterally to open the external nasal valve. To avoid donor morbidity, Gotex slings have been used, but with a high rate of complications such as infection. Subperiosteal facelifts are more effective and aim to raise the origin of the zygomatics and the levator muscles of the lip. Regional muscle transfers have been described to dynamize the face by utilizing the functioning trigeminal nerve on the paralyzed side. Local muscle flap may enable dynamic movement of the oral commissure. The two muscles that can be used for this purpose are the masseter and temporalis. Temporalis muscle flap is quick, simple, cost-effective, and especially useful in old age patients. This action is during mouth clenching and provides excellent aesthetic and functional results. There are numerous modifications of temporalis muscle flap to animate the oral commissure or the eyelid. In 1997, Labe first described temporalis myoplasty technique, which separates the temporalis muscle from the temporal fossa and allows a lengthening by a redistribution of muscular fibers to the detriment of the posterior third for lip animation. Recently, minimally invasive temporal tendon transfer only via intraoral approach was reported. Currently, temporal myoplasty is regarded as the most commonly used non-free flap muscle transfer option considered feasible with good outcome. Although masseter transfer has been attempted it was associated with a poor results or considered to be technically challenging. Traditionally, the masseter muscle transposition flap requires detaching the muscle insertion at the mandibular angle and reattaching it to the oral commissure. The limitation of this technique is that the vector of the pull is too horizontal and it does not simulate the natural smile. The masseter muscle is detached from both its origin and insertion and transfer to a new position 
to imitate the function of the native zygomatic major muscle. The availability of the viable mus facial muscle is an important issue in facial reanimation. Facial muscle may remain viable up to 12 to 24 months, but after this time is deemed irreversibly atrophic. When there is no viable musculature, the muscle may be important in the form of the free muscle transfer. Gracilis muscle and the latissimus dorsi is one of the most commonly used choices. Gracilis muscle has constant anatomy and is a simple dissection and is of intermediate bulk but with minimal donor deficit and hidden scar. A two-team approach is available. A large latissimus dorsi can split into two independently innovative territories. We reported the outcome to 13 patients who underwent interfascicular nerve splitting and dual innovation technique in JPRAS journal this year. Faster and more powerful re innovation through the masseteric nerve, as well as spontaneous smile through the contralateral facial nerve, can be achieved with this technique. Interfascular nerve splitting is not technically difficult, taking approximately 15 minutes under microscopy or high magnified surgical loops. This technique could in induce greater shoulder function improvement compared to other studies regarding donor site mobility of muscle sparing latissimus dorsi flap or TDF flap. Our patients showed the same level of the recovery within 12 months compared to at least three years of recovery in other studies. Two-stage procedure has following advantage. Above all, possible confirmation of innovation before nerve co-optation is the biggest advantage. However, it usually takes 10 to 12 months to confirm the presence of a tinnitus sign favoring axonal regeneration. One stage procedure is introduced to overcome this advantage of two stage method. Paralysis of mandibular and cervical divisions can lead to unopposed action of the lip elevators. As a result, a symmetric smile that is commonly noted by patient. The approach to this is augmented activity of the affected side or reduced motion in the normal side. A number of methods have been proposed to re-establish the lip depressor mechanism, including mini hypoglossal transfer, anterior belly of a diagonal diagastric transfer, and platysma transfer. Because these procedures leave considerable scar on the neck, some prefer the approach of weakening of the contractor size using botulinum toxin. There are various techniques for outcome evaluation following facial reanimation surgery with free muscle flap. Consensus has yet to be reached for postoperative outcome evaluation. Turch's facial grading system evaluates facial symmetry at rest and quality of smile. It was created in 1997 to evaluate the surgical outcomes following free muscle transfer reanimation procedures. A shortcomings include that it does not evaluate recovery of essential facial functions, nor does it assess psychosocial recovery. Numerous newer tools have been reported in the literature. These include Emotrix and the Clinical Guide Graded Electronic Facial Paralysis Assessment, eFACE. Emotrix is a facial measurement software that utilizes machine learning technology for facial landmark identification and evaluation of facial movement. Another potentially significant tool, eFACE, overcomes the limitation of other clinician-based tools in that it dependently analyzes static, dynamic, and synkinetic facial feature. In conclusion, few authors have reported direct comparisons between different surgical methods because of lack of widely accepted grading tool. There is one study comparing neural versus muscle reconstruction for ocular sphincter reanimation. The results showed better results in the neural reconstruction where viable facial muscle was present. Another study showed that outcomes from free muscle transfer are recognized as providing result superior to cranial lobe transfer or local muscle transposition. Most importantly, it is essential to match the patient's wishes 
to the reconstructive technique to achieve patient satisfaction. Thank you for your attention. I hope all of you understand all fields of facial lobe reconstruction. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful presentation, Dr. Chang. Unfortunately, Dr. Chang is involved with his team in, the, in operating on a facial trauma at the university, and he asked us to cover for him. So I'm going to ask Dr. Basil Hassoune, our Novomed ENT surgeon, to uh, cover for him the part, the part of uh, the Q&A question. Dr. Basil, I'm going to start with the first question. Do you, is there any way, considering that the facial nerve has many variations in the anatomy, sometimes unpredictable, is there any way to prevent or, or test for the presence of, of such anomalies? Uh, I think that is the... Thanks, Dr. Mazin, for this uh, interesting question. Uh, there is a lot of variety for the anatomy of facial nerve and anatomy. It has been uh, a lot of publications about the different patterns. Uh, occasionally, there are overlaps between the different branches, the upper division and the lower division. Uh, individuals who have uh, these anastomoses between the upper and lower divisions has um, better recovery when a one division is injured, particularly in trauma. Uh, a lot of the data that Dr. Uh, Hank Cheng presented are related to complete facial nerve injury. This usually happens as a result of uh, Bell's palsy that is not recovered or a complete transection of the nerve due to trauma or due to tumor resection. Uh, in this case, there's not a lot of important in the variation of the anatomy because all divisions of facial nerve are sacrificed. And usually the reconstruction are aimed to restore two important things. One is the function, particularly of the eye, lid closure and eye protection, and the mouth for oral competency and for uh, animation of smile. Uh, I hope this is kind of like a brief on things. Is there other questions, uh, Dr. Mazin? I'll also can present a couple of uh, questions here from our audience uh, that have been sent to us. Uh, one of the questions that uh, our audience asked are, what are the limitations that uh, facial nerve paralysis impose on patients? Uh, and I think there are two uh, important limitations that the patients experience. One are functional issues, and these are with the highest priority is the eyelid protection because these patients can develop a corneal exposure and keratitis. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, Dr. Heng talked about uh, using gold weight or using cartilage conca to uh, promote eyelid closure and lubrication uh, due to the loss of the orbicularis muscle. Also oral competency uh, is an important issue uh, and that is in the lower third. There's also very important psychosocial uh, trauma that these patients experience. They often feel isolated. They don't like to socialize. They feel being stigmatized. And it's very important to attend to their ability to reintegrate. And uh, of particular importance to these patients that the facial animation, particularly with smile, having a natural and symmetrical smile, is something that's uh, on the very high priority of their list to be able to express and show the emotions uh, during their normal interactions with uh, friends, colleagues, and uh, the environment. There is another uh, question that's related to using botulinum toxin A uh, in uh, synkinesis. How long does it last and how you can use it? I think the usage of uh, botulinum toxin uh, would be uh, to target muscles that have been apparently re innervated uh, by the facial nerve sprouting. So we can target some muscles that are being expressed when people are smile. Sometimes other aberrant muscles are involved. And generally, the target is to soften these uh, unwanted uh, synchronesis uh, muscle activation with the uh, a, a neurotoxin. Uh, generally, this uh, uh, treatment lasts for between three to four, sometimes six months. It really depends on the individual and the type of neuromodulator that's been used. 
sometimes uh, repeated use of the neuromodulator can weaken these muscles and provide longer lasting results. I think we're also gonna add uh, Couple of two, a couple of uh, maybe one important question. I think uh, here in um, for us as a plastic surgeon, facial plastic surgeon, one of the most important uh, problems that we encounter with regard to facial nerve injury are things that are traumatic, usually related to surgery, uh, where people are undergoing deep plane facelift or going orthognostic surgery, and a specific branch of the facial nerve, usually the either frontal branch or the marginal mandibular branch, are injured during procedures. Uh, and, and I think it's very important to uh, have some of the feedback of uh, Dr. Heng Cheng of how to uh, work with those patients, when would be suitable time to intervene uh, and to provide the best uh, outcome and recovery. So we'll have some of those questions uh, sent to Dr. Heng and have his uh, feedback uh, to our benefit. Okay, I'm going to start the next session. And I'm going to start by introducing my friend, Dr. Sahar Ghazad. Uh, she is uh, a renowned plastic surgeon in Dubai, and she has been there for 27 years, dedicating her work to plastic and reconstructive surgery in the last 21 years, mostly cosmetic and aesthetic surgery. She subsequently specialized in cosmetic breast surgery, body contouring, body lift, and especially after massive weight loss. She is renowned for her work in uh, reshaping the buttocks and using fat transfer and also using stem cells. She has been using uh, duplicated uh, mesochymal stem cells for more than last more than 10 years in aesthetic surgery. Uh, create billions of cells, you know, just using 15 million regular fat transfer. She started her work in UAE in 1999 as the first full-time female plastic surgeon in the UAE. And she received her appreciation award in June 2004 that was presented by the Emirates Plastic Surgery Society for her involvement in the initiation of the Emirates Plastic Surgery Society. She shared with the Koreans her hard work and discipline and attention to detail. Dr. Sahar. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. The third speaker is the Professor Kohiomens. He is the Chief of the Department of Plastic Surgery at Samsung Medical Center in Sangan uh, One uh, University. He is known more than 12 years experience with micro surgery. He has uh, an associate editor in many important uh, plastic surgery journals uh, like PRS, PRS uh, Open, uh, Global Open, Artists in Plastic Surgery, and also Micro Surgery. He is the uh, chief of a training, microsurgery training program at Samsung uh, Medical uh, Center. He has more than corresponding author for more than 79 uh, important publications. And it was us and a younger plastic surgeon uh, with interest of microsurgery. You will love to read his article that he published in PRAS in May 2020. He has a comparative study between uh, two surgeons a two team, the expert uh, microsurgeon and the uh, trainee who they just finished uh, training. And he had very good news that the complication rate uh, was not, there's not significant between the two teams. So he wanted to tell you on that study, if you read it, that you can start a safe career as a young plastic surgeon, young, uh, microsurgeon, if you find for yourself. Uh, center structural microsurgery training in very qualified teaching uh, center like the one he is uh, directing. Today he will talk about very important uh, topic, which is the advances in microsurgery breast reconstruction with the uh, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 microbial.
It is my great pleasure to be here to present updates in microsurgical breast reconstruction with DIEP flap. I'm Guihan Moon from the Department of Plastic Surgery, Samsung Medical Center. Our center is a tertiary care center in Seoul. Uh, we have almost 2,000 in beds and have 9,500 outpatient visits per day. Our breast reconstruction team is composed of five surgeons in Department of Plastic Surgery. We perform 840 major reconstructive cases annually. We are also running breast and microsurgery fellowship for doctors from the Middle East countries. DIEP flare was first described by Dr. Koshima and later popularized in breast reconstruction by Dr. Allen. It's now the largest considered the preferred reconstruction option among autologous tissue in breast reconstruction. Lower abdomen has been the donor side of the flap, uh, starting from pedicular tram, then free tram, and muscle sparing tram. Uh, type of the flap has changed toward minimized invasiveness to the lower abdomen. So now the DIEP or SIEA flap is the most advanced latest form of the tissue we frequently harvest from the lower abdomen. So uh, I would like to share with you five updates in DIEP flap breast reconstruction. The first one is the enhanced role of the CT angiographic uh, planning. Uh, based on CT information, we made a, a very solid plan. So the operation itself can be a very uh, straightforward and we also obtain the volume information of the breast and the lower abdomen, which will be quite uh, helpful for safely plan the pedicle. And the CTA also can predict the risk of the venous congestion or the donor sign mobility. And we also screen the sarcopenia if patient have. Uh, when patient has a dominant perforator at the a favorable location, it's quite straightforward, easy procedure for planning this uh, flap. So the large sized single perforator is planned, can be harvested. But sometimes uh, there is no dominant one, so we have to select very carefully the number, location of those non-dominant perforator to get the maximum safety. Intramuscular cause of the pedicle is easily visualized so we can uh, simulate our upcoming intramuscular cause of dissection before surgery. So this lady has large single dominant perforator number seven in this CT images was planned solidly. So the operation was quite straightforward based on our planning on CT images. So a year after result. Another case, uh, when there is no dominant one at the favorable location, multiple perforator can be planned as seen in the preoperative marking. So uh, the three perforators as planned was exactly harvested in the operation and this is the year 15 months after. So we diligently refer to the CT images uh, during the surgery, but there is an issue how to transfer the CT information to the patient body. Uh, so we use uh, augmented reality application for that purpose, superimpose the CT images on the skin of the patient. So we transfer the key structures of our interest to the skin using this application. We can see the, how that marking is uh, accurate compared to the real anatomical findings. So all the markings matches quite well with the real anatomy. So it's a quite uh, e efficient way of transferring the CT images on the skin of the patient. Uh, we developed a method of uh, estimating the tissue volume by uh, calculating the serial area of the cross-sectional area in the breast and the lower abdomen. So we obtain volume of the breast and the abdomen. We compare their ratio and plan our pedicle based on that uh, volume ratio. 
uh, we frequently have to use a significant uh, portion of the contralateral abdomen uh, in our population. So how to safely uh, perfuse those contralateral abdominal tissue is our major uh, issue. So when there is a high uh, chance of hep uh, using a significant portion of the contralateral tissue, we have to plan differently. So this lady, uh, based on CT volume estimation, 88% of the volume is required to reconstruct the matching breast. So bipedical intraflap crossover anastomosis method was planned based on that volume estimation. So two on the left side in primary pedicle side, the other one on the secondary pedicle, uh, bipedical the flap was planned and executed at and intraflap crossover anastomosis was performed. And this is the result a few months later. Uh, th this immediate reconstruction case using a skin reducing mastectomy incision, uh, very high rate of uh, estimation of the needed tissue from the lower abdomen was expected. So the bipedical uh, DIEP flap with intraflap crossover over anastomosis was performed in this case also. But this is 31 months after uh, following nipple areola complex reconstruction. Uh, this is a delayed case, also required a high, significantly uh, a large proportion of the lower abdominal tissue is required to get the matching breast volume. So bipedical breast reconstruction was uh, planned and executed. This is the result three years later after reconstructing the areola complex. Uh, when we browse the CT images, or, or we need to check the communicating vessel between superficial vein and perforator because superficial vein has dominant role originally uh, for venous drainage function in the lower abdomen. So when there is no significant good caliber communication, there is an increased risk of uh, venous congestion after flap is elevated. So, so selecting the perforator with good caliber, direct communication with superficial vein is uh, important to reduce the risk of development of, of venous congestion. Uh, DAEP flap is a uh, most advanced form in terms of minimized donor site mobility, but it still has certain uh, chance of development of bulging and hernia after the flap harvest. So when we can, uh, if we can predict the risk of donor site mobility preoperatively, it would be quite uh, valuable and informative. So, uh, previous study uh, using the CTA images tell us cross-sectional area of some certain muscle can predict the risk of bulge and hernia. Uh, our study on the right, we found abdominal protrusion above the iliac crest was associated with that risk of bulge and hernia. So our study uh, aged in smoking and using lateral row perforator and those uh, abdominal protrusion over, over 22.3 millimeter was associated with increased risk of bulge and hernia. So we gave them certain scores. If the sum of the score uh, passes over the seven, there's a significant increase of uh, development of progen hernia. So uh, lower slide with similar BMI, but has quite different score of, uh, left one has a very uh, high protrusion with advanced age, so the score was quite high and the right one is a young patient, but without uh, abdominal protrusion, so the score is quite low. So we can estimate that risk of bulge and hernia uh, through this method. Sarcopenia is a decreased skeletal muscle, uh, can be defined by skeletal muscle index, which is a cross-sectional area of the, those blue area of the skeletal muscle, uh, divided by square the height of the patient at lumbar fifth Roomba level. So when it falls below 38.5 in female, uh, sarcopenia can be diagnosed. 
uh, it, it can influence general health, uh, including uh, postural complication. Uh, the, the association of the sarcopenia with the donor site mobility of the DIEP flap has been studied with conflicting results. There was increased postural complication in a study, but another study doesn't find any association. Our study, having the largest group of sarcopenia, over 100, based on our analysis, uh, sarcopenia was associated with uh, various complications, including abdominal bulge and hernia. So uh, with this information, the risk of the donor site morbidity, uh, we can handle the situation quite proactively by uh, switching our plan to more conservative way or paying more attention to reduce the invasiveness during the surgery. So th that CT information is quite uh, valuable uh, for preoperative planning and performing surgery. So those are the f uh, five uh, roles of the CTA-based uh, planning in DF flat breast reconstruction. The second update is perfusion assessment by fluorescent angiography. Uh, this can visualize the tissue, the tissue perfusion in real time, so it facilitates the intraoperative assessment of peripheral perfusion of the DIEP flap. Recent studies showed reduction of fan necrosis by using this technology in several studies. So we routinely uh, perform uh, fluorescent angiography during the surgery after full dissection of the pedicle. Uh, if one pedicle perfuses a significantly large area of the tissue, uh, it can be safely uh, harvested. And, and this patient has an estimation of 62% was uh, uh, known through CT volume calculation. Uh, one perforator on the on her left side showed uh, sufficient volume of that estimation, so we uh, select only one side of the perforator to reconstruct her left breast. So the estimated volume was quite similar to final inset uh, ratio. Uh, this is uh, a year after without uh, perfusion-related complication. Uh, this is delayed immediate case. Uh, estimation of the volume uh, is about a little over 70%. So we prepared the bipedical uh, DIEP flap. We found very little tissue is perfused through single pedicle. So we chose a bipedical uh, method based on uh, fluorescent angiographic finding. So this is the intraoperative view after harvesting bipedical DIEP flap. So nine months after without experiencing any perfusion related complication. So fluorescent angiography uh, increases the precision in identifying non-optimal perfusion area. So it can reduce the risk of perfusion related complication. So and also, it is quite helpful for decision making on performing vascular augmentation to perfuse a contralateral hemi abdomen. The third update is uh, less invasive DF flap harvesting. Uh, uh, preservation of nerve, muscle, and fascia and its continuity is important while we harvest DIP flap to reduce the invasiveness of the procedure. Preservation of motor nerve branch during pedicle dissection is essential. Uh, but when it causes in between two perforators, they ha had to be uh, transected and repaired after harvesting the pedicle. Uh, she didn't experience, experience any functional morbidity uh, 20 months after. Well, rectus fascia Preservation has been attempted uh, recently using laparoscopic or robotic approach. The incision length was markedly reduced. Instead, we developed a facial tummy saving technique. So we limit the facial tummy length uh, 
um, by uh, conducting dissection under the muscle and under the fascia. So we still can have a sufficiently long pedicle using this technique. The two polyptos were planned on her left side. So those two perforators marked are being dissected and the proximal pedicle is approached under the muscle, under the fascia, without facial autonomy with proper retraction. We reach the external iliac vessel through this facial autonomy saving approach. So fairly long pedicles can be achieved using this technique. The, another case, number nine, perforator was uh, targeted and harvested using this facial tummy saving technique. Uh, only 4 cm long facial tummy was required to get this pedicle. Uh, other exemplary cases uh, using the same technique. Uh, when we harvest bipedical flap, we use the same procedure to save the fascia bilaterally. So when we compared our experience with former historical group, uh, we could avoid bulging hernia in our case group, and there was a slight uh, better muscle function at six month time point. So the DA uh, has evolved further by using this less invasive harvesting technique. So it, I think it is quite different from traditional, quite invasive DA flap. The fourth uh, update is neurotization of the DIEP flap. Since the spontaneous recovery is quite inconsistent, neurotization of the flap uh, is an emerging technique, uh, and several studies showed uh, imp uh, favorable result by performing this uh, neurotization. Two recipient nerves can be used based on which recipient vessel is approached. So we routinely perform uh, neurotization of the DIEP flap to anterior branch of the intercostal nerve or the lateral cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve, depending on the situation. Our early uh, results showed some improvement of the sensation, in, especially in delayed uh, cases, but it is too early to say any significant uh, difference. The last update is enhanced recovery after surgery. It's a standardized perioperative care protocol to minimize surgical stress and rapidly restore normal function. It has been accepted in various surgical specialties and also in the breast reconstruction. The, in the previous study, in breast reconstruction showed decreased length of stay and pain and opioid use and et cetera. Uh, consensus guideline has been uh, uh, published in breast reconstruction and our protocols are established in line with those recommendations. Should MPO time and early mobilization and uh, less use of IV lines. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that any adverse event after surgery can dramatically change the course of the recovery. So we also have to pay uh, equal attention to minimize these un event, uh, the adverse events. So our current return to OR rate is 0 0.3 and loss of flap is 0 0.2 until now. This is the overview of the ERAS protocol in our uh, center. So when, after impl implementing ERAS protocol, we found shortened length of stay and MPO time and times of enoxaparin administration and some reduction of pain early in the post-op period. Uh, in, in the ERAS protocol, we try not to use in 
uh, drains because it can cause pain and limit patient mobility. So by performing uh, quilting sutures and others, we could avoid using uh, drains. We routinely check any fluid collection when patient visit the clinic uh, after uh, discharge. So if there is any fluid, it can be easily uh, aspirated. So the, the case of uh, right breast reconstruction without using any uh, drains for the breast or the, the abdomen. So uh, I have shared with you the five updates in the EP flat breast reconstruction. With this advancement, uh, DIEP flap has become more attractive and safe option in breast reconstruction. Shukran. Thank you, Professor Hu, for your lovely presentation. Uh, there are two nice questions that I will start with my personal one. Uh, you are depending on the CT to measure the volume of the flap. Oh. So you were depending in your presentation about uh, the CT to measure the volume of the flap, but you have a paper you published it in 2017 that you have, if you can depend on even just simple fish case, you have your own formula and you have an app, which I downloaded myself, it was very interesting. Uh, are you still using it or you think this is just as uh, for a uh, hospital, which is not like tertiary hospital like yours? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, the quality of the, of the audio is not uh, ideal, so I cannot catch your question quite well. Uh, I still use a CT volumetry method uh, along with the application you, you have mentioned. Uh, those have different, uh, 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 they, they are two different methods. Uh, but I try to use both to get uh, better accuracy. Sometimes the one method is superior in terms of correctness, uh, but both uh, can help to me to uh, estimate the volume of the breast and the abdomen. So I think it's very critical for me as I'm uh, explained because uh, our population needs uh, uh, more, more, more than half of the lower abdomen you know, tissue to reconstruct one breast. So the volume is our uh, critical information preoperatively. Thank you. I have one of the participants and the question. He's asking how often that you plan to do deep flap, but intraoperatively you need to change to a free trauma flap during surgery. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I never change to muscle sparing type of uh, muscle sparing type during the surgery uh, because my plan is uh, quite, quite fixed uh, preoperatively by browsing CT images. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't switch to muscle sparing uh, for many, many years. I think I can harvest all, uh, all, all, all the pa uh, DF lab from the older patient if there is a perforator, uh, unless there is a surgical uh, previous event on the target area. So technically, there is no, no, no contraindication. Mm -hmm. Another question, uh, what of what people are asking, if you have an, a patient with a blood clotting disorder, do you consider it as a candidate or contraindicate to do uh, the other flap for them? A patient with the clotting disorder, is still a candidate for the other flap uh, reconstruction oh, or contraindication? Oh, yes. Oh, age itself may not be a, a big issue. Uh, if the patient is healthy and desire to get the breast reconstructed, uh, I I strongly uh, recommend DIEP flap also. Uh, I, I'm not sure you, uh, I got the point because of the a little 
suboptimal audio quality. Okay. Um, I have my personal also question. I found that in uh, an interesting publication that he published in 2021, that is the decision about the reconstruction, whether early or late, whether to go to the implant or to go to the uh, tissue flap, free flap, or whatever the decision, it depends on the health insurance of the patient. Is this the system in your uh, country? Because we are not very familiar with the health system in Korea. But that's what I found it in your paper, which is very interesting, that the final call is not the, the patient case or your team decision, it's the insurance of the patient. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, in our country, uh, both implant and uh, flap is uh, equally uh, covered by uh, the same uh, national insurance. So insurance coverage isn't an issue to our patient. And so I explain, uh, I give all the option to the patient and, and I, I will let my patient fully understand the procedure and decide by herself. So decision, actually came from my patient. So I'm just assisting very uh, minimally, uh, uh, try to be a very, very unbiased and fair. Yeah, we have many, many implant uh, reconstruction cases. Yeah, much more than flap, but the information should be given very fairly uh, unbiased. Uh, so that is the key role of the reconstructive breast surgeon in the decision making stages, but insurance is not our uh, concern. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, Thank you. I'd like to introduce for the next session um, our next moderator, Professor Wayne Smith. Professor Wayne graduated from the University of Pretoria, where he's a professor. He's a plastic and reconstructive and cosmetic surgeon. He focuses on plastic surgeries after significant weight loss, as well as other surgeries. In our practice, we can do uh, minor, uh, you know, flyaway here, but when it comes to missing ears or serious defects, we refer to him for management of the patient. Uh, Wayne is a personal friend, and I credit him for many things he did with us. Uh, he pushed us to uh, monitor and question every minor complication we have. And we also, I credit him for pushing me to start uh, the reconstructive part because we are focused mainly on aesthetic uh, cosmetic surgery. So we are expanding our reconstructive practice and uh, uh, hand surgery, etc. And uh, he has a serious uh, interest and experience in cranial facial. Uh, cranial facial plastic surgery, and he used to do uh, surgery for brain cancer through the nose. So, with all these qualifications, he is a great moderator to take over this next session. Wayne? Hey, good morning, everybody, and thanks for all the speakers that have preceded this talk. Uh, it's a wonderful privilege and pleasure to do this as a collaborative effort between the UAE and uh, South Korea. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce the final clinical speaker, and the topic will be current trends and updates in reconstructive surgery of the ear. As plastic surgeons, we all know the difficult challenge that this poses in our practices, and I look forward to the experience of uh, Professor In Suk Yun. Uh, Professor In Suk Yun is the Associate Professor at the Department of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Yonsei University, Gangnam Severance Hospital in Korea. 
He has extensive experience, and I look forward to hearing his uh, anecdotes and input uh, in this field. His research uh, portfolio includes tissue engineering, medical 3D printing, which is an exciting uh, opportunity that lies ahead of the next generation of plastic surgeons, nanotechnology, adipose stem cell derived uh, growth factors, and then he has experience in craniofacial congenital anomalies. Uh, he sits as a director for numerous boards, including the Korean Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, as well as the Korean Cliff Palette Craniofacial uh, Association. Professor Yun, over to you, and I look forward to your chat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Inshing Yun and I am working in Gangnam Severance Hospital, Yonsei University, Seoul, Korea. I am very happy to be able to present here today. My topic is current trend and update on ear reconstruction surgery. Ear reconstruction is performed when the ear is damaged due to microtia or congenital anomaly or trauma or burns. In most cases, ear reconstruction surgery is performed because of microtia. This is a relatively common congenital anomaly. Since Tanger announced a six-stage uh, method for ear reconstruction using rib cartilage in 1959, Brand's four-stage reconstruction method has been followed by now widely used two-stage ear reconstruction surgery. In two-stage ear reconstruction, the first operation involves fabrication and insertion of the auricular framework with costal cartridge, tragus reconstruction, and lobule transposition. Approximately six months later, framework elevation is performed at the second stage. In the first stage, as you can see, the ear framework is fabricated by harvesting four costal cartridge from six to nine. This is tools for costal cartridge fabrication. Then, while transpositioning the remaining ear lobule, make a pocket into which the ear framework will be inserted through a W-shaped incision on the back side. At this time, the lower part of the plane may have poor circulation, so part of it, it is preserved as a subcutaneous pedicle. Then, while maintaining the subcutaneous pedicle, insert the framework, remove the remaining tissue, apply a negative drain, and finish suturing. I'll show you a video case. This is a male 21-year-old patient who had lobule-type microtia. This is a designing of a ear location. This right side is normal side. So now I decide the distance from face to ear. This left side is a part which I make a new ear. So now localize the new ear position. And this is the design of a pocket incision. Actually, the posterior part inside like a W shape. And this is a part of 
the cartridge harvest, usually we use six re cartridge to nine. And this part is subcutaneous pedicle, which I should preserve. Make incision on the lobule side first. And this is the posterior part. This part is lobule, which will be uh, transposed to anterior part. And uh, now removing the remnant cartridge. And more pocket dissection for cartridge framework insertion. This is the cartridges. Uh, which I harvested from the patient. Actually, this is an uh, adult case. The cartilage looks slightly calcified. This is a video of cartilage framework uh, fabrication. We use template like this and draw a design line according to the template. And inside the cartridge, following the design, and carve the cartridge along the design. This is another basement part. And connecting the base part with wire suture. and place another cartridge on root of helix part. And anchoring the cartridge with wires. In other case, we cannot make a helix with one cartridge, so we use several pieces to make a helix. This cartridge is for anti-helix. Also, fix the cartridge with wires. This is a making a travels part. We use another cartridge part and make a design and connect the cartridge and finishing the cartridge framework fabrication. And now I insert the cartridge framework into the pocket, uh, maintaining the subcutaneous pedicle, and close the skin flap with sutures.
So this is end of first stage operation. So in this video case, this is preoperative pictures and fabrication of cartridge framer with adult cartridge and after first stage surgery. Let me show you some other cases which had completed the first stage. This is uh, another picture of Robil type myocardia and after frame of insertion. This patient is a small concat type microtia, and this is also a picture after first stage operation. This patient is Robil type myocardia, and the picture on the right is the after the first stage surgery. After six months, the swelling subside, then it will look like the picture on right. This patient has large concar time microtia. In which case, there is no need to create the tragus and lobule part in the frame In the picture, after six months later, the low part of the ear is showing a much more natural shape because the original ear tissue was used. The second stage is performed after about six months and an incision is placed on the back of the ear for elevation, then harvest the superficial temporal fascia and skin to cover the backside. Then another costal cartridge is harvested and carved to support the back of the ear. Then it is covered with superficial temporal fascia and skin graft is performed. This photo was taken during the second stage surgery and you can see the framework to support the back of the ear and superficial temporal fascia. After that, it is finished with skin grafting. These are the pictures of before surgery and first stage surgery and after the second stage surgery. When viewed from the front, you can see the size and angle of the ear fit well. This patient has large concal type microtia who has completed the second stage. The size and angle of the ears are also well maintained. In adult patient, as I told in video's part, the costal cartridge is calcified and making it difficult to fabricate the framework. You can't bend the cartridge to make a helix, so you have to connect more pieces to make a helix. Other than the method using autologous cartridge, there is a method to reconstruct the ear using a polyethylene implant called MEDPO. This is a different surgical method from using autologous cartridge because there is a risk of exposure to the MEDPO. The MEDPO has to be covered with superficial temporal fascia and a skin graft is performed over the MEDPO. Unlike the autologous cartridge method in which skin grafting is performed only on the back side of the ear, the texture, texture of the skin is different when using MEDPO. This is a patient 
who reconstructed the ear using Medipro, and the color matches well, but you can see the skin texture is slightly different. From now on, I will talk about ear reconstruction surgery using 3D printing. The process of making ear implant using 3D printing proceeds in the order of obtaining an image from the patient, designing the shape of ear three-dimensionally, and printing it. We use CT image of the patient to obtain the image from the control lateral normal ear. This procedure is remove other part which I will not use. And by mirroring this, I got an image of the ear that match the part with the defect. This is normal part and this is contralateral defect area. And we will change this to the framework type used for the actual surgery. This is called 3D modeling, and it is the task of selecting only the part of ear image to be made as an implant. This is how the 3D model looks like. Since the implant is actually implanted into the skin, it is necessary to calculate the thickness of the skin and remove it. Therefore, it is the proce process of removing the skin thickness. This is what the final ear implant looks yeah. like. Next, I am working on the 3D printing a model to check the design is good enough. Here on the right side is a patient specific ear implant that I can actually use for the surgery. It is made of a polymer called PCL. I will show you a case of patient who has surgery using this. This is a patient with right microtia and implant was made in the shape of left normal ear. The surgical design was the same as the design using autolox cartridge surgery. After making a pocket for the implant to fit in, the implant is inserted and the surgery is completed. It took three to four hours less than the usual surgery using autolox cartridge. The picture on the right is after removal of the sutures. The second stage ear elevation has not been performed yet, but this stage will also be performed by manufacturing a 3D implant. The implant for the back of the ear is shaped like this. 
and it can be made with much thinner than when using Otros cartilage. So the concave curve of the back of the ear can be expressed well. As a next step, we are conducting research on producing an ear implant using bio-ink with human cartilage tissue, which is superior to PCL material. Collaborative research with clinicians and multi-part engineers will allow 3D printing technology to be further utilized in ear reconstructive surgery. Thank you for your attention. Professor Sun, thank you very much for a comprehensive review of uh, reconstruction, uh, mostly focused on microtia and uh, congratulations on very nice results. Uh, I have two uh, comments and questions. Uh, the first is um, your preference with salvage procedures, either due to infection or failure of the reconstruction, uh, what you like to do there and what your experience is with osseointegrated implants with implant-based artificial ears. That's the first question. And the second question is your preference for the use of MedPaw versus autologous cartilage. I wonder if you'd give some thoughts on what you prefer to use and when. Good morning, uh, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, your question. Uh, at first, at the salvage procedure, I, when I use the implant like medical, uh, it is hard to uh, save the implant from the infection. In some case of repeated infection, uh, I should remove the implant and next stage I, I'll try with another uh, surgery with otros cartridge, but the infection is uh, not so severe. Then I, I'll try some of local play like a um, mysteroid partial plate or something else, posterior occipital artery based plates, that kind of uh, plates. But uh, I experienced some of uh, case, some case of remove the implant. And next question was uh, what I prefer the metaphor and atros cartridge. Uh, Actually, I recommend Otros cartridge first because I think it is now the gold standard for your reconstruction, but the patient is too early. I mean, under the age of 10 year old, uh, but the patient or their parents uh, try to reconstruct their year be before uh, they entering, enter the school. Then uh, you have no choice. So, then I try medical, but uh, I have, I uh, depend on the patient or uh, their parents. So they will choose what, uh, what uh, procedure they will take. Right, and then uh, just a question on the use of osseointegrated implants with artificial ears. Uh, your experience with that and the role of that in failed reconstructions? Uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot hear. So can you ask me again? Sure. Uh, what I'm asking Professor Yoon is the role of osseointegrated implants with artificial ear reconstruction on the implant in salvage surgery. I've had nice yeah, results mean, with those, and uh, especially in the adult patient who's exhausted of repeated events to try and salvage primary reconstruction. I think osseointegrated integrated implants uh, driven into the mastoid provide really good aesthetic results, and they function aesthetically as well. 
uh, your opinion on that, please? Yeah, you mean the processes of austere integrated yes. with the screw? Correct. Yeah, I have some case, uh, but nowadays in Korea, uh, we actually do not use austere integrity screw and processes because there is a little difference between ear reconstruction result and processes. So many patients after they have, have uh, processes, they still want have ear reconstruction surgery because they want their they their real skin covered ear. So nowadays we actually do not use uh, austere integrity in processes. But some but, but I have case with uh, infection after the screw anchored uh, on the mastoid bone. So. Um, then in that case, I remove remove the screw and uh, reconstruct the ear with uh, autolos cartilage. I try to uh, that procedure uh, every time. Awesome! Thank you for that. Uh, most enjoyable and good results. Congratulations! Over to you. Dr. Thank you Max. so much. Pleasure. That was very impressive. Uh, what is so interesting is that uh, we can today use this uh, 3D printing and the teletechnology to, to watch the video, watch the best parts of the video. It's not taking too much time and all from the comfort of your work or from your home and get the, for those participants, five valuable internationally recognized CME credit hours. Uh, we will be following up with a video of the training programs that they have at the university for any participant who wants to take courses. They come in different size and shape and budgets. Could be one week, one month, six year, six months, one year, etc. One of the requirements by the regulators, at least in the UAE, but increasingly around the world, is that if you want to get privileges in any hospital in a procedure such as uh, 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 microtia or anything else, you have to show that you have done as a primary surgeon at least 15 operations during the last year. And so my question to you, when those uh, fellows come to you, I'm assuming they do hands-on assisting of the primary surgeon, correct? Yes, I think we not have just, many cases. Not just cadaver or observation. They scrub and they assist. Uh, scrub and assist, I try to have the chance, but we have some uh, regulation on our hospital, uh -huh. so we will discuss our uh, hospital and I, I will answer uh, if somebody apply to me. Okay. But I try to have some chance to have real surgery with us. Thank you everybody for attending. I'll be using my 21 year of experience and network and the team we have at Novomed to make this program of uh, uh, education by the Koreans more accessible, more affordable, and more effective. And uh, the beauty of it is that it's open to all specialties, not just plastic surgery or dentists. And we'll be making friends and we'll be making the program uh, better every year. Thank you, everybody, and 